the reality is you think that's an idea how do we do it who knows how to do it how do we work with them and you know you just keep keep plowing that that route episode 157 Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I'm speaking with Simon Pakeithley. Now, Simon is the CEO of the Business Improvement District, Camden Town Unlimited and Euston Town, as well as being the CEO of the Camden Collective and the Camden Highline. He's also the co-chair of the Cross River Partnership and chair of Camden Giving. Now, Simon sits on the London Enterprise Action Partnership, which is otherwise known as LEAP, and is a champion for all small businesses. During the pandemic, Simon was seconded to the Mayor's COVID Business Forum and the London Transition Board, where he chaired the Business Reopening Strategy Group. He now sits on the London Recovery Board, and Simon has been leading the Camden Highline Project since its inception in 2017. So in this conversation, Simon and I discuss what Camden Town Unlimited is, how it operates and how it aids and facilitates business growth and really, you know, us as architects, we often call it placemaking and how they are um, facilitating this project to Camden Highline. So Simon talks about how that operates, um, what the uh, Camden Town Limited does and how they interact and interface with the public and also how they work with architects. So sit back, relax and enjoy this absolutely fascinating conversation with Simon Pakeithley. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, Please follow the link in the information. Simon, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. How are you? I'm good, thank you, Ian. Thanks for having me. My absolute pleasure. Now, you are the Chief Executive at Camden Town Unlimited, which is a it's a kind of interesting, innovative, public-private partnership that you've got with Camden Council or Camden Town itself. Yeah, it's not, it's not directly linked to the council at all. It's an independent body. Yeah called a business improvement district and the way bids work is you sort of define a territory yep. and then anyone in there who pays business rates above a threshold which you set yeah um gets a vote and then if a majority vote in favor uh, an election that the council conduct then um uh, a bid is formed for five years mm-hmm. and then everyone who was eligible to vote gets a little precept added to their business rates which is normally one percent of their rateable value so it's a bit like being a kind of local councillor for business sort of but we work a lot with the council but we're actually independent from right okay so you've got very close intimate relationships with the council but it's not actually a local authority yeah entity i don't think they call it intimate but yes it's quite <laughs> close <laughs> Good. And you're also the chief executive of the Camden Highline project, which yes. is one of the projects which has been led by the Camden, Camden Town Unlimited. Exactly right. Yeah. So that, that's the beauty of the business improvement district model, really, is that me and my team are already bought and paid for, if you like. Yeah. So things that the membership and the board kind of can sign up to, we can just get on with. Yeah. So we've got Camden Highline as a project. So we're not having to sort of fundraise for our own salaries. Mm-hmm. Um, we can just do it and we've got a lot of expertise around we can draw on. We've also got another sister charity called Camden Collective. Right. And that's about reusing or using meanwhile space. And mostly what we do with it is give away that space to young creative startups who are not typically we work, should we say. Right. Um, and uh, that's kind of about fostering the next generation of creative entrepreneurs in Camden. Um, but again, that's a sort of standalone, sort of standalone entity that the bid has set up. And it uses the bid as its parent, if you see what I mean. Got it, got it. So how do you did want you... to know what the first rule of Camden Collective is? It's very important. Don't talk about Camden Collective. <laughs> <laughs> it should be. No, it's don't be an arse. Don't be an arse. I like it. I don't like be an it. arse. Yeah. yeah. And it is, it's a really important rule. I mean, it was sort of a joke at first, just because we became a bit, you know, tired of people coming and using the space for free and not giving back. But yeah, um, it was, it, it's become a very good filter, actually. Brilliant. So how did you, how did your career progress into this? This is a very interesting kind of um, domain that you're occupying where you're, you know, in, involved in improvement of the city, involved in, with local businesses. There's, it's, 
it's kind of entrepreneurial master planning all mixed up into into one how did how did your career move in this direction and how did something like um the, the canon unlimited come into existence in the first place well it was well i, I started my, my professional life was playing in bands in camden you know as sort of a, ah. a, a, a jobbing musician what um, did you play uh, well, a bit guitar, but I was a singer-songwriter, really. Okay, cool. And uh, I've played in all the shit venues in Camden. You know, there isn't one I haven't, like, you know, s- stuck to the floor at, probably. But we're going about 30-odd years, you know. I've, so, I've, I've, um, I've played in many Camden venues myself as well. There you go, it's there sticky. you go. I, I, think, I think we were probably on, on different different eras, but, you know. <laughs> uh, and, but you know what dog, I mean. Dog and Ball in Kentish Town, that's the one of the... Oh, the Bull and Gate. The Bull and Gate. Bull and Gate. The, the Bull, Bull and Gate. Ah, oh, it's an it. Bull and Gate was an institution. John Beast. Did you play with you, <laughs> John Beast? No, I don't know. John no, Beast. no. Okay, no, that was a different era. There's a great Facebook group actually uh, run by Mick Mercer, who who's got that brings up all the photos from that era. Anyway, um, we digress. So, so that was how I started. Then you know, I I had kids and family and needed to get a job, yeah. um, started businesses, and eventually ended up working for the Labour Party in right. the sort of New Labour era. And then I actually worked for Tony Blair a couple of times in the general elections after 97. Oh, very cool. Um, and I was there for all, all of that, which is great and very exciting and very educational. Yeah. Very sharp end, quick education. Um, but that mix of business and politics, I think, is what led me to this, because that's mm-hmm. what I do, really. It's about yeah. understanding what it's like to run a business and understanding how politics works and trying to kind of sit in that public-private space between them yeah. um, and get stuff done. And I think we we quite often say, you know, there, we sit in a space, particularly at the moment, where local government's got no money. Mm-hmm. Regional government has surprisingly little power, actually, uh, certainly compared to other sort of regional authorities. So the mayor of New York has a lot more power than Sadiq Khan, for example. Right. Um, national government's obviously very distracted. You know, we sit in a strange place where we can just get on and do stuff. Yeah. We've got a democratic legitimacy. We've got our own bank account. We've got a team. Um, and, and we can just do stuff provided we can bring people with us mm-hmm. um and i think that gives us quite a nice place to experiment fantastic and so um the camden unlimited what was the inception of that how did that well business improvement districts have been around in the states for about 40 years right and so there was a sort of this is before my time i, I, I was somebody else set the bit up um but it, it, there was a a town center voluntary group of mm-hmm. businesses and working with the council and then they use that as the basis to set up to use this legal mechanism that was um it began life i think in 2003 something like that maybe 2006 yeah um and um so yeah the, so it was already established and then i came in but of course we have to go and get re-elected every five years so i've been doing this 14 odd years now Got it, got it. So we've been around a few elections. And are, are there other business improvement districts across London or in, in the UK? There are. There are. There are. I think there's 70 in London now. Right, okay. 300 in the country. But a lot of them, I think, the, 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 the sort of bigger ones in the sort of centre of town, they tend to be more focused on retail or on, you know, the kind of cleaning uh, ambassadors sort of stuff. Yep. Um, and then I think the smaller ones out of... More, more out of big, the big conurbations would be more concerned with putting up hanging baskets and, again, a bit of sort of keeping the place tidy and safe. Yeah. And I think partly because it's Camden Town um, and partly because we've just been lucky, really, and, and, and I think recognise the opportunity of a vehicle like this mm-hmm. to play. And I think that's what I like to think that we do a lot of the time is play with ideas and try and see which ones will work, you know. So how how does some of these these you know these are some fantastic things that you guys have been involved in from the Camden Collective, the High Line? Um, how how do these things kind of emerge? Are you and and, and what's the sort of interaction that you have with say, you know, people like placemakers, like designers and artists and architects and? Yeah, I mean, quite, obviously we we've uh, um, we had a big design competition for the High Line, and we appointed a design team. Right. who have just about finished their work for the first stage and we're submitting for planning um, any time now. There's always some last thing that needs to be done, but we're pretty close to submitting for planning. So, yeah, that involves designers, planners, you know, landscape architects, all sorts of people, really. So we're sort of in the place-making, place-shaping business. Um, though, interestingly, we don't tend to use that language very much. Um, right. But I think that's just coincidence. I think we're just not very educated. 
so so th these these sorts of ideas like the canon collective or the canon highline who 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 first comes up with them is it just you identifying kind of assets in camden like physical assets and and kind of looking at them and thinking you know what this needs a bit of love and attention or is it yeah i mean you, you i mean we, with the community or there, there's there's a i mean to be honest every now and again we have a bit of a mad idea and go well i wonder if we could and then we'll start the process of you know can we get the boards to buy into it because obviously they've got to sign off any spend including our time yeah um so i mean the highline actually was someone else's idea as a chap called oliver o'brien as a, an academic at ucl did a little study on i think the 10 most likely bits of disused railway that could be used in this way and a local newspaper the kentish town had picked up on it and you know we saw it there in fact right. it was, it's the guy who's now the chair of the highline was the a then director of arab in canada he'd been on our board my board previously and he's i think his wife saw it and, and, and he phoned me up from toronto and said I think we should do this. And he was coming back soon. So, um, so that kind of got things going, but yeah, it, it's not, it's, it, it's very easy in, with retrospect to kind of make these things sound like great plans that were, mm -hmm. you know, the reality is you have an idea, you try it a bit, you pivot, you try it a bit more, you know, you yeah. come in different directions and gradually it comes together. You know, I, I think we don't, we don't admit that enough, frankly. Yeah. Could, could you give us a little bit of an insight then of the process that you've been going through with the Camden Ham Highline and where you're at right now with it and what's, what's left to, 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 to do, what's the next phases of it and, and how you've sure. been involved in it. And yeah. Yeah. So it's, I mean, it re it's been going about four years now. So, and that's from sort of nothing to about to submit for planning. Mm -hmm. um, so we had a big crowdfund, the mayor of, mayor of London put some money in, the bid put money in. We did feasibility work. We developed a relationship with Network Rail because it's their land. Yep. Um, got, you know, TfL, the mayor, county council, everyone on board, but also did an awful lot of kind of back of the pub shoe leather engagement with local groups mm -hmm. um, and just gradually kind of got that buy-in. And, you know, we've got 1,500 people have been on walks um, uh, so far. We've had well over 1,000, you know, tiny donations on our website. And I think just once people get it, they really get excited about it. Initially, of course, we had to go out and sell it quite hard and just just do the, the work, really. Again, if if me and my team weren't already bought and paid for, yeah. this would have to be being done by volunteers. And, and it's just a much, much harder road. You know, it's a steeper hill if you've got to do that. Whereas, yeah. you know, we, we, we're around and we're up for doing this sort of stuff. So and then and then we got to the point where we, you know, we were then out and raised a much bigger chunk of money. Mm -hmm. um, we've raised about a million quid to date. Um, and that's got us to the point where we had an international design competition. We've appointed the design team. They've come up with a master plan for the whole thing and detailed design for one section. And barring last minute hiccups, that'll be submitted for planning quite soon. Amazing. We might we might run, fall foul of the local elections, actually. But I'm hoping it'll go to planning in May or June. Great, great. And, what was and then we've got to raise the money. That's the important bit. Next, right. next phase is to raise the money to build it, you know. So, so if you get if you get planning, then you've got you've got a few years to raise the money, and then to actually get it on site and start yeah, exactly. building. Yeah, exactly. But you know, we're 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 on the on the path of money already. So, yeah. you know, I always I always say to people, who do you know? Who do you know might be interested in funding this? And we think it'll be a mixture of like private sector, high net worth individuals, trusts and foundations, and the public sector that all sort of come together to to fund it. Brilliant. Um, yeah. And, and it's good fun anyway. With with running a competition or setting a competition up like that, what were what were some of the things that you needed to you know be very cognizant of, or some of the concerns that you that you have, or the or the things that you're you know to make sure that you're you're getting the most out of the the people who are entering. How do you how do you design and run a competition like that? Well, a lot a lot of that is fairly established processes. So we actually hired a consultancy called Colander who ran the competition for us and in a sense held our because we've never done that sort of thing before yeah held our hand through the process so that you know we ended up with um a proper jury who would then make the decision we had a technical panel making sure that it was something that could be built um so so in a sense it's not that different from any scheme it's just we're not making money so we've got to you know finance it in non-traditional ways 
um, which again, you know, having the business improvement industry behind it is very helpful. But you know, things I, I I wish I was on the jury because Brian Eno was one of the teams that submitted and didn't make the shortlist. <laughs> now, to me, that's outrageous. I can't, I can't. I was furious when I found out they hadn't shortlisted his team. But you know, that's that's what you have to do, isn't it? You give give it to a jury, they make their decision. And actually, the team they picked in James Corner and Field Operations have been. I, I cannot speak highly enough of them, actually. They've been brilliant. It's been real pleasure to work with them, and they've come up with something I'm really proud of and impressed with, you know. Amazing, amazing. Did you get to hear the, um, was it was it a, a, some kind of sonic landscape? <sighs> no, <laughs> no, because it didn't even get to the shortlist. It was like, you know, it, it, yeah, there would have been some sort of sonic landscape, as you say, to go with their thing. I'm he's sure, he's but, a Camden uh, resident, isn't he? I he's believe so. I believe so. But I've never met him. So, you know, that's why I wanted him <laughs> on the shortlist, at least. Anyway. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. So, so in terms of then raising funds for a project like this, what's what's that process like? How do you go about finding investors? And is it, you know, I mean, the, the reality is, it's it's like it always is with these things. You know, it's not that clever. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of shoe leather work. It's about building relationships, getting to know people. Um, you know, we're expanding the team shortly to include some professional fundraising help. Yeah. A lot of it is still down to, you know, me and my immediate team to, you know, go and talk to people. People who are going to give you lots of money tend to want to talk to the people who are going to be building and running the thing, not to, you know, professional or arm's length kind of um, fundraisers. So, um, and again, that's the nice thing about a business improvement district. You know, one day I'm having to deal with crime issues in Camden Town and the next time, mm-hmm. you know, talking to some very wealthy people about funding an exciting project. You know? I love it. So some, mm. of the, some of the other things that you've been involved in, um, you're, you're involved in kind of crafting some of the streets or the streetscapes as well. And yeah. so kind of uplifting yeah. parts of Camden. How does, how can you tell us a little so, bit about so that? So again, you know, works? we recognised, I mean, this, we're going back over 10 years now, um, go, right. you know, recognising that the main streets in Camden Town were not as they could be. So we commissioned a master plan of what could be done and then just gradually started the process of getting local authority and TFL, because they own the roads, to buy into it as as, as well as being part of the creation of it. And it's it's fundamentally, it's a lobbying exercise. All that we do is a lobbying exercise. Who are the people who've got skin in this game? How do we develop relationships with them and, and get them bought into this idea? Mm-hmm. Um, so with the streetscape, we broke it up into chunks, you know, and then tried to fund each chunk in a slightly different way. Um, and we've still got one of those chunks to go. You know, these are quite long-term things. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's not, it's very easy, I think, to kind of overcomplicate these things or to create a, you know, clever sounding narrative after the fact. Yeah. The reality is you think, that's an idea. How do we do it? Who knows how to do it? How do we work with them? And, you know, you just keep keep plowing that that route. How, yeah. how, how do you navigate the, the kind of complex political landscape that's involved in town making and, 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 and place making? Because it's, you know, as an architect's perspective, you know, I've been involved in projects before which have had sort of green lights going ahead and then there's been a change in local council or a change in government and then the project stops and it's all very disheartening and then you're, in many cases you're back, to, you're back to square one and it can be incredibly bureaucratic and there's no shortage of, of architects and creative thinkers, if you like, who have got ideas for the city or got ideas, but it seems that it's very hard to make these things become manifest and there's a big sort of political component to that. So how, how, how do you navigate that or what, what are some of the challenges that you typically come up against? Well, I don't think our challenges are really that different to everybody else's, frankly. I mean, right. we, um, you know, we, we, we're having to go jump through the same hoops with the high line that, that, that any commercial developer would. Yep. Um, and because it's not commercial and because it's, a charity and it's you know we're not making money out of it and it's pure community benefit um or and business benefit that's not i'm not discounting the fact that it will benefit the businesses of the area at all but yeah. you know it has a lot of good things about it so we, we find that you know getting the look, sadiq khan had it in his manifesto his election last year yeah. um uh, we, you know, the Labour group had it in their manifesto at the last set of council elections in camden um so you know i think we're just quite good at talking to people and mm-hmm. you know helping understand where they're coming from and work out where we want where we want to go fits with where they're coming from and 
you know, it's again, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, maybe it's a, maybe I'm being, um, maybe the thing is we've just been lucky because we found projects that everyone gets excited about and we've just kind of pursued them that way. But, um, um, and maybe I should be saying, no, no, it was this really clever, you know, <laughs> genius bit of uh, engineering work and lobbying that produced this. But, you know, fundamentally, it's all about talking to people and hoping that they like what you like, really, isn't it? Yeah, brilliant. Love it. Um, in in terms of... There's a load, load, of, load of your listeners now, a load of architects absolutely hating me now, isn't there? No, they're, they're, Making they're, it they're, sound so easy. <laughs> they're they're, they're going to be... Well, this is it, right? So there's... Well, what kind of advice would you give to architects and and people who often they've got ideas for 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 what can improve the city, and sometimes with developers that a developer can often have their own very strict business agenda, mm-hmm. right? And it's you know the city the thing that's being developed needs to tick all these boxes, and then if you just get it through planning, you know with the with the minimum amount, and obviously then that causes its own challenges what advice would you give to uh people that have got ideas for, to how to improve their their local arena their local spaces what would what would be something for them to do what would be a way of campaigning or how do you and I, i'm suspecting that this comes quite naturally to you that you're, that you're very good at being able to get people enrolled into an idea um i, I think that i think the thing is that I'm certainly aware that we spend a lot of our time doing is is trying to match our ambition to other people's. Right. And I think sometimes I, I, I'm aware that developers or architects will have an idea and in a sense be quite wedded to the purity of it. Mm-hmm. And, and that's not saying I, I enjoy compromise. I don't. But, you know, th- th- there is a... There are ways of doing it where you're kind of fitting what you're trying to do in with, um, and I think the I think the planning system is given to conflict, uh, and I think that doesn't help. And I know that um, it's much easier for someone like me to go, look, we're building the High Line, isn't it amazing? Look, we give away all this space to young cool people, isn't that amazing? You know, yeah. and and local people who wouldn't care about planning things normally will want to be supportive, and that's never going to be true of a commercial developer, you know. Yeah. No matter how much, you know, engagement they do, they're still going to come up against the same, forgive me, but six retired architects and one retired planner who determine just about every planning decision I can, <laughs> I come across, you know, um, I've, I often think that it's almost like the work of a retired architect to have their revenge and all the people that have objected to their planning applications <laughs> when they were working. Um, maybe I'm seeing it too I, have got I, I can really <laughs> see that being played out. <laughs> I have I have got friends who have told me, you know, I've asked them, what are you doing over the weekend? And they've told me I'm writing this letter to the planning department yeah. about whatever's getting built across the road. And I'm like, right, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, our system does not lend itself to allowing people or encouraging people who are not retired architects good at writing letters with time on their hands to just have a view. You know, we, we and they, it's quite, if you get into, uh, too often, I think, you get into rooms where, people are trying to do that consultation Mm -hmm. and the retired architects are getting all the airtime you know or even the practicing architects and you know it's i see that happen all the time you know and they have such strong quite aggressive views um and ordinary folk who just aren't used to being in those sort of rooms get crowded out by the noise Mm. and then just don't bother coming back you know um but i don't know you know i don't know whose fault that is um, but I think we we could all think a bit more about the people who aren't paid to be in yep. the room or aren't benefiting. You know, um, you know, if I own a house in an area where there's a development, I may not like the development, but I'm probably going to get increase in the value of my house. You know, yeah. So I've got skin in the game, whether I'm getting paid or not. But we often are chasing opinions from people who are the only people in the room not paid or benefiting for to be there. Yeah. Um, and then the odd one or two that you can like persuade to sit still for a bit and not get bored out of their mind, you know, gets asked all these questions. So I, I think we need to think about how, how we remunerate people in those sort of situations. Mm. Um, and certainly we've done some of that, um, trying to kind of yeah, so how, pay how, people for that. How, how do you do that? How do you broaden the conversation and, and kind of have a, a wider context in, of people involved with stuff? Well, like- I think, I mean, actually we, we learned some of the, I'm chair of a charity called, um, Camden giving and they, 
become a real um, uh, sort of uh, leader in the field of participatory giving. Right. So it's very it's it's, it's a charity that sits between the public and private sector, and uh, hello, um, and it's um, takes grants from various ways and then distributes them directly to very small organisations who would never get it together to you know put together a lottery application or something like that. You know, they try and take out some of the paper, the, the legwork really yeah. of, of doing that. And a key way that they do it is by these participatory giving panels. So they actually recruit people from the communities they want to get the money into to make the grant making decision. And that's not people like you or me just sitting around like, you know, asking them what they think every, every now and again, it's, it's their money. You know, yeah. you decide who it goes to. Um, and I think we've tried to learn from that in some of the alternative Camden work that we've done, um, I think in, in, in as part of the Highline engagement work, it's very easy to get people who are homeowners in Kentish Town to understand what the Highline is because they've probably been to New York and they, you know, see it, get it, easy. By the yeah. way, always like to make this point, the Promenade Planté in Paris was there before the New York Highline. <laughs> Oh, was it people always people, people don't realize that the French were there first. I like to say, much like America. So, um, um, sorry, that's my Alexa there chirping up. Um, the uh, so, so, but but trying to get people say down at Maiden Lane at the King's Cross end who probably haven't been to the New York High Line or they went to New York they didn't bother going to the High Line. Mm-hmm. Um, getting them to understand it and engage with it is a much more shoe leather intensive process. So that's where you know we actually part of the spec was you've got to have someone in there whose job it is to try and reach deeper into those communities. Yeah. We'd already done loads of engagement, but it was a lot of people who were, you know, coming to us. who got That's it quickly, word of mouth spread. And, you know, can you come and talk to this green group? Can you come and talk to this? You know, we were doing loads of that. But I think, you, you know, the important thing was to notice that the groups that weren't being caught in that. Uh, and so part of the design team's, uh, team was was a company called Street Space, who right. actually employed someone from the area to help with that engagement to you know disseminate and again you get very different messages from those sorts of engagements than you do from you know the good yeah, well, it's, 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 it's an, a really interesting process of like how you're going to explain these ideas and sometimes you know to to somebody and you know what what kind of are you going to do it through images? It's not always that easy to understand it through plans and sections. Like that's a notoriously difficult way to explain something quite complicated. And so obviously you can, you can have 3D images or these kind of moments of everything looks happy and exciting and stuff. But again, there's also a lot of editing that goes into it. And it's just trying to enroll people so they understand what the, what the impact of, of it is. And also what? giving them a voice. It's a kind of, yeah, I think that's, that's really important. Um, I think, um, well, we got some sketches done quite early from right. a really good little design studio, Studio Weave, and they just helped articulate it. And then we sort of matched them up against pictures of the actual space so that people could orientate themselves. And we just had five of those. Um, and that we, we used quite extensively in the crowdfund. And then it's a lot of just going to talk to people. And, um, you know, there's always people don't understand the basic concept. You know, mm-hmm. people are you know, think that we're going to take away the trains or something, you know, yeah. um, or, you know, people just have, you know, so you, the more you need in a sense to keep engaging because otherwise people's pe- people get misconceptions and, and, you know, that doesn't mean you don't always it's still encounter people who don't want it. You know, yeah. I, mean, I, I know at least three people who will be putting negative responses into our planning application, you know, so, so, um, so how, how does this all this engagement, how does it support the planning process, the planning applications? So now you guys are just, you're ju- just about to go into um, the, the planning application. Um, once it's, once it's in, what, what are the planners looking for in terms of communi- um, engagement and communication? Well, of course, there'll be, the, there'll be the, the, the actual consultation that the council will undertake. Right. Um, and, and then we, you know, we've, I mean, the beauty of employing people whose profession is engagement is they produce nice reports for you. So that's quite easy. Plus, we've got all the engagement stuff that we've done already. So I think we're, you know, compared to most projects of this type, we're kind of way ahead there anyway. Plus, you know, everyone, you know, we've we've got some very nice big donations from, um, you know, a couple of big landowners in the area. and but But an awful lot of those over 1,000 donations have come from local people who are only putting two, five, 10 pounds in. But that's oh, a hell wow. of a vote of 
vote of confidence. Yeah, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah, you just and, and we're not really plugging it. And we had a crowdfund to raise about. Um, I think we tried to raise about thirty grand in mm. twenty seventeen. Not sure, I think something like that. And we ended up raising about sixty. Um, but the rest of it is just, you know, we we just there's a donate button on the website, and people donate. And whenever we send out a newsletter, we are oh, don't forget to donate. People do, and um, you know that's a nice really hard tangible bit of endorsement yeah um that, that that helps but you know again if you if you're thinking about your listeners there aren't, there aren't going to be many commercial developments where that's happening so it's um you know we are we are peculiar and again you know we're back to this point about this weird public private space mm-hmm. you know this isn't where most people operate yeah uh, and it's quite ignored for that yeah um but it also has has a lot of opportunity in it it's amazing it's how, so what would you say makes a successful relationship with with the architects for example and the design team and the team that you know have been creating the spaces if you like and how i don't know is your truth <laughs> i'm not it's not i do this all the time you know? <laughs> <laughs> i mean look, you know we, we when we hired james corner and his team we did our due diligence and we talked to other people who worked with them and they all said they were brilliant and they were, it's not that (laughs) much more complicated. You know, we ran a competition. They were very, very impressive and they really understood what they'd done. They'd also built the New York high line, which gave them a huge advantage, of course. Um, Although they played it down so hard because they thought it would work against them. (laughs) Um, You know, Um, but actually, of course, it gave lots of people confidence. It wasn't, it it wasn't, it wasn't nearly as as negative as as they feared. Um, so I think, you know, if we, if I think of the things that have, have worked well, I like to think my chair, Richard Terry, is very good at saying, you know, I think we're a good and reasonable client. Mm-hmm. You know, we try to be an intelligent client. That's his words, not mine. Yep. Um, and, and I think that's right. We have done a fair amount of sensible groundwork and we're not turning up with our own sketch pads and ideas. We're trying, we tried really hard not to design it before we got there yeah um uh and some of that's frankly you know again because i've got in fact two retired arab directors on the, the trustee board of the high line who both were board members of camden town unlimited you know who therefore i have a sort of long-standing relationship with but you know i can pull in people like that yeah. to help with these bits of the process. It's very different from an organisation that, you know, would be pulling in local volunteers to do it in their spare time, which is so often the way with these sorts of projects. Mm-hmm. Um, having having the bid has given us huge advantages in lots of ways, yeah. Brilliant. I love, love it. And what, what other sorts of projects are you involved in at Camden Unlimited? Um, well, we're trying to do some sort of, we, we, have, we have this thing we call the, starting to call the Green Loop. Right. Which is looking at the way in which we talk quite a lot about town centres and high streets. And I was in a big seminar with the GLA this morning. I sit on the London Let, by the way, for as long as they exist. Um, so I'm kind of also interested in it from a, from a London perspective. Um, but my hat there is very much about small business. Right. Um, but this was a, sem- a, a, a group of people on the London Recovery Board trying to think about how town centres and high streets are evolving post pandemic. Um, and we look, we think a lot about town centres and high streets in isolation. We don't think very much about how they connect to each other or the communities around them, in fact. So we're trying to talk about the Green Loop as a four mile cir- circuit that runs Camden Town, hopefully down the High Line, King's Cross, through non Euston Road routes to Euston, through to the park up onto the bit of the canal Camden and if you think about that as a, a way of three town centers and a big world park mm-hmm. linking together you start to think about the way those places interact with each other or don't right. a lot more and so you start to think about well you know what are the green routes around these town centers how in a 15 minute city world or you know with e-scooters 30 minute city you know how do you how do you think about the way in which these places interact with each other? So that's, that's another, another project. We'll obviously take the climate change agenda very seriously, yeah. but we're trying to sort of, you know, come up with a base level of stuff that businesses can do. Cause a lot of it is business, you know, the long tail of carbon emissions is small businesses who have absolutely no time to think about this stuff. You know, it's all about yeah. this afternoon's takings, you know? And so someone turning up on the door, well-meaning and saying, you know, did you know that you could, you know, is, is just, meaningless really to a lot of businesses but maybe there are things that we can find that can be done easily or that can be done collectively 
they can then sort of you know be part of through the bid or so we try and think about things like that but you know we're always we're always trying to find new and interesting ideas we have events sometimes we had cam cam and inspire we had last uh autumn i think so that was just like taking over a bit of camden town filling it with different interesting things running off the back of our collective project so that was um there's a great um young man um uh called finn who's done camden open air gallery so he started getting graffiti artists he knew to decorate the shutters in camden town when they're all shut right cool it became quite a thing you know graffiti artists wanted to do it because you were given a blank canvas and people would tend not to tag it because yeah. it was, you know, um, and so we, so we started working with him to, to do the Camden Inspire Festival. So he, and then he started creating artwork that would, that was independent and could be sold. And now he's got a shop on the high street. And I mean, you know, it's not just through us. I mean, he would have done that anyway, but it's, it's spot again, you know, we're in that place where we can see these things mm -hmm. and try and work out how we can take them further. It's part of Camden Collective. Actually, a few years ago, we got a double fronted shop, and gave away the space to 12 market stalls. Mm -hmm. So again, young retailers who hadn't really done it before, they'd get a free spot in this market on the high street. And um, uh, we experimented with that for as long as we could. You know. Love it. Oh, it's really, really fantastic to, to hear an organisation like yours existing um, and you know, really occupying this very interesting, interesting space between public, private, and, and helping, you know, decent projects master planning happen very cool yeah, it's great fun as well <laughs> excellent well i think that's a perfect place for us to conclude conclude the conversation that was really really insightful um to understand about the, the camden highline project and camden unlimited and and what you guys have been doing and it's incredibly inspiring so Simon. thank you by the way i should just say it's camden town unlimited camden we're town. not the whole borough it's just camden town camden, camden town. town and euston yeah wonderful brilliant simon thank you so much my pleasure. Great to talk to you. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.